will see 15,000 learners participate in programs. Standard Bank has helped hundreds of thousands of learners grow their lives. This year alone, our Grow Your Life book and library projects will see 15,000 learners participate in programs specifically designed to enhance both reading and entrepreneurial skills. These programs will be run through our Grow Your Life library program, of which we have 21 fully functioning container libraries placed in underprivileged areas throughout Gauteng. Standard Bank has played a vital role in our Grow Your Life projects. Thank you for helping to make miracles possible. Amazing. Okay, well, before we kick tonight off, um, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. And an even bigger thank you to our esteemed guests, Rabbi David Macinta, Hein Wagner, and Steve Brooks. Just based on the numbers of viewers we have this evening and the excitement around, around tonight's talk, it is evident that people are truly inspired by all of your achievements. Here is a brief background on, it, on our accomplished guests. I will then hand over to you, Rabbi. Hein Wagner has been blind since birth. Despite this, he has accomplished many incredible feats. He has completed the Absa Cape Epic, ran the Antarctic Marathon, the Two Oceans and New York Marathons, completed full Ironman, completed in the World Triathlete Series in Cape Town, finished several Cape Town cycle tours, tackled the white waters of the Zambezi River, climbed the 10 highest mountains in the Western Cape, completed the Cape to Rio yacht, yacht race and holds the world's blind land speed record at 322 kilometers per hour. Hans' unique experience and outlook on life afforded him numerous invitations to share his story. And in 2004, he decided to take up motivational speaking as a full-time career. Hein is living proof that despite the challenges that come our way, anything is possible. He does not allow his blindness to stand in the way of his dreams. And people often refer to him as a blind man with exceptional vision. Our next guest, Steve Brooks, holds a national higher diploma in civil engineering and is a founder and current CEO of Baldwin Properties. Bourne is a JSC's only national large-scale developer of turnkey sectional title apartments aimed at the mid to upper market segment. Prior to founding Bourne in 1996, Steve spent four years as a civil engineer at ESCOM and three years as a, as a project manager at, Ma at Matrix. Steve is also the chairman of Bourne's Foundation, a nonprofit company established in 2016 by Bourne Properties aimed at making a social difference in the educational training and funding landscape. The foundation provides scholarship bursaries, awards, and loans for studies, research, and teachings in areas relevant to Bourne's business model to ensure the development of a future generation of skilled practitioners. Steve is passionate about environmentally responsible building practices and is a driving force beyond Bourne's approach to minimize its environmental impact by achieving green building ratings as its developments. If any of our viewers have any questions for our guests tonight, please post them in the Q&A box on top of your screen and Ryan and myself will do our best to get them all. Once again, I would like to thank you all for your time this evening and over to you, Rabbi. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much for joining our webinar. And a very special welcome to Hein Wagner all the way from Sweden and Steve Brooks, CEO of Baldwin Properties. Ladies and gentlemen, Jewish people are commanded to pray three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. Before we pray in the morning, we say blessings. Where we thank God for the things that people take for granted in life, the small things that we take for granted and the big things that we take for granted. One of the things that we thank God for is sat. We say the blessing, pokeach ivrim, God who opens, thank you for opening the eyes of the blind. Now, on a simple level, we say this blessing for physical sight. Thank you, God, for giving us physical sight. But on a deeper level, on a more personal level, on a spiritual level, we thank him, God for giving us the ability to see, to see the good things in life. To see the, we thank him, God to, for, for giving us the ability to see, to see the opportunities in life. And we thank him, God for giving us the ability to see the good in others. But think about it. How many of us are blind? How many of us do not see the good things in life? How many of us do not see the opportunities in life? And how many of us never see the good in another person? Tonight is the night we stop being blind. Tonight is the night we open our eyes and we see. And there is nobody better to take us on this journey than my good friend, Hein Wagner. 
And Han, I must say to you that the moments, the time that you spend in, my, in our home is still cherished by my family. So thank you. And thank you for doing this. And over to you. Thank you, Rabbi. And uh, a warm welcome from Sweden because it's summer up here. People have often ask me as a blind adventurer, Hein, how on earth does a blind skydiver know when he's close to the ground? It's quite simple and easy because you can feel the slack on your guide dog's leash. You know, then you know now it's a good time to open up or you're going to be gone. No, I'm only kidding. I don't skydive with guide dogs. I love them too much. But I was born blind. And the only thing that I've seen before is stars. Hundreds, thousands, in fact, millions of stars. And that happened the last time I did not believe my guide dog when I walked into a tree. So these days I believe the animal. This evening I want to take you on a little journey, as Rabbi mentioned. But what I want to share with you is three universal laws. And you know these laws, every one of you. But what I want to leave with you is the amount of light that they have generated into my life since I started using them. I also want to share with you some very positive things that came out of this worldwide unprecedented crisis called Corona slash COVID-19. My business, for one, uh, grew substantially uh, since, the, since the lockdown and since it all started, but it also had a lot to do with the way I choose to look at this crisis. So I was born with a condition called Leber's congenital amaurosis. I don't expect you to remember this. All it means is my eyes my eye cosmetically develop normally. The receptive cells on my retinas didn't develop. I was born blind. My parents, in fact, the doctors only discovered this when I was six months old. So mom and dad was completely freaked out. There was no blindness in our family. They did not know what to do, where to turn. So mom and dad did some research and they found out there's a school 100 kilometers north of Cape Town uh, that can cater for blind children. So at the age of five, I had my second biggest traumatic experience. Mom and dad decided to drop me off at boarding house and blind school. For the first five years of my life, of course, I could find my way at home to the bedroom, to, my, to the bathroom, back to my bedroom, the kitchen, that familiar spaces, especially my bedroom, that deep dark cave I never ever wanted to leave to face the bright lights of society. I simply couldn't believe my parents did this to me. Got so lost at that boarding house, couldn't find my way to my bedroom. Some days I couldn't find my way to the bathroom in time. But at least I've got an excuse. I can't see what it is, so it helps a little bit. Soon I realized these kids are walking around the school grounds making strange noises. One would click his tongue, another one would slap with his hand on his thigh. And I phoned my mom. I said, is this a school for blind or mad children? Why are they making these noises? Soon I realized if I don't click my tongue while I was walking down the passage, all these blind buggers kept walking into me. So I started making noises to avoid them. For those first five weeks in blind school, the only thing I wanted to do was to get back home and hang out with my sighted friends, the kids whom I knew since I was in my diapers. I had to stay five weeks in blind school the first time it goes, they said, if I'm only five years old, this young, a blind a child blind will never adapt to that new environment if he or she doesn't stay for at least five to six weeks before you go home the first time. I counted the hours, the days, the minute. All I wanted to do was go back to my sighted friends. My old life, the life I had, the five years of freedom I felt I had at home as a blind child. So that Friday afternoon arrived and I couldn't wait to get into the car and go back to Cape Town. And as I stepped out the car, I was about to try and reach out. I tried my best to reach out to these sighted kids whom I know since I was in my diapers. And I realized they completely, totally rejected me from their little play group. My single biggest traumatic experience of my life. I couldn't believe they rejected me. Nothing changed. They all knew I was blind when I left. What's wrong? Why now? And as I stood there, I realized I'm going to have to do something to reintegrate myself into this little group of kids. These are my friends, so to speak. So, and I realized they're all on their bicycles. They're up and down their driveways. They're cycling up and down the road. And I realized the only way that I can be accepted back into this sighted little group of kids is to get onto a bicycle. Now, blind kids do not own bicycles. Unless your parents are fairly sadistic. You will not own a bicycle as a five-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old blind kid. 
My brother, who sighted at a bicycle, it was twice my size. And of course, I took it off the garage. And I started walking up and down the driveway with that bicycle, deciding today I'm going to join these sighted kids. I'm going to do what they do. Two hours later, I'm still walking up and down the driveway. No idea how I will do this. Three hours later, the tears are running down my face. And I'm realizing that, Hein, you will never be able to do this. And I was about to throw the stupid bicycle down and just walk away from it and give up on it. And a little voice in the back of my head said, take just four more paces. In those four steps, I could hear as clearly as daylight the reflection of the noise coming off the bicycle's gears bouncing against the pavement. It was a tiny, tiny sound, but I realized if I focus long enough and hard enough on that tiny little noise, I can use that feedback to cycle in a straight line. Well, two weeks later, I was going up and down the driveway in a straight line. Three weeks later, I challenged all these sighted kids and said, come on, guys, do you want to dice me? I promise I'll keep my eyes closed. I won't cheat. Many of them didn't take up the challenge. Blind school was an interesting time in my life. Eventually, I, I got to love it because I was in and among 300 blind kids with similar challenges. We solved the problems of the world in blind school. It was amazing to have that camaraderie and have that, the kids with the same challenges. Uh, we got up to very naughty stuff. And we also had similar syllabus to the ordinary school, mainstream schools. The only difference was we had not biology, but physiology. And the reason for this was the teachers searched the entire planet. They couldn't find a strong enough microscope for the blind guys. So they said, let's stick to something you should know fairly well at the age of 15, 16, the development of the human body. There I was sitting in the back of the classroom, the physiology teachers discussing the fun functionality in detail of the eye. Well, needless to say, I was bored out of my mind. But something she said raised an idea and a thought, triggered something in the back of my mind. And it was a question that came up. So what? How many kids are actually born with this LCA disease that leaves you completely blind? And I thought, well, I have to go research this. So I sneaked out the classroom, made my way to the library to go read up about this. By the way, uh, our physiology <laughs> teacher was also blind. She never saw me leaving. It was incredible having blind teachers who could easily pull the wool over their eyes. 15 of us in the classroom, 10 would sneak outside, sit in the sun, and the five that stays behind us goes, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Got into serious trouble because of my yes man tricks, but I went to the library, I dusted off a number of braille books because believe me, if you try and read a braille book under the dust, it becomes an incredibly long story. You never get to the real point. But after some research, I discovered that only one, one out of 80,000 kids are born with LCA. And I had a choice that day. I could either see this as the most negative thing that I've ever discovered, but though I could embrace it with absolutely everything I own and say, hang on high. The fact that you're different to 80,000 kids is the most unique, the most special, and the most positive thing you've ever discovered. Let me be brutally honest with you. The single most difficult decision I've made to date. But the one thing that I've learned in life, if you make a decision based on your gut feeling, that feeling from deep within, do yourself a favor, stick to that decision because it might just be the best one you've ever made. So I finished my matric. And in fact, I was the first blind kid in the school back in 1990 to write my entire final exam on a modified PC. So it was an ordinary computer. And I realized once we installed that voice card, I realized that my only bridge between being dependent on sighted people and be completely economically on all levels independent as a blind person, the only bridge is technology. So I fell in love with it. I embraced it. I went to study computers. I was going to work in the IT industry no matter what it took. I moved back to Cape Town. I did a number of computer training courses, scored great good grades. I mailed out my CV to a hundred of companies. I never received a letter of regret. Never got a phone call to state, we don't want to employ you, nothing. Another six months down the line, I'm like, done more courses, more CVs. And I realized, but what's going to happen to you, Hein, for the rest of your life? Nobody wants to employ you. They don't even send you a letter of regret. And as I sat in my bed that morning, I realized that there's a big mistake on my CV. It's only three words. And those three words read, blind since birth. 
you know what I did? I just deleted it. I took it away. No more. Within four days after sending out the one without the blind since birth, I had five interviews lined up in the CBD of Cape Town. And I felt quite chuffed because none of those people knew there was a blind man on his way to the interview. Well, I ended up working in IT. I, in fact, I spent 12 years working in IT. My, my last IT job was international sales manager for a massive multinational. All of a sudden, I had 20 sighted people report to me and my team. I uh, had a quarterly goal of 25 million US in terms of sales. And uh, we were bought out by an American company. Things went well. I was at the absolute top of my game as a blind person, I felt. But somewhere deep within me, I felt something is missing. I'm cutting a great check every month, making some good money. But I realized something was missing and I wanted to find out what is missing. And I realized I don't understand my purpose. I was so busy working with this blindness, trying to find a way around that, that I completely forgot to do introspection often enough to discover my purpose. And within all of this, I was busy doing some adventures on the side, some teachers asked me to come and speak to children, to the kids at school. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, I realized my purpose is simple. It's very simple. My purpose is simply to inspire people to turn obstacles into opportunities. That's exactly, exactly what I did with my blindness. How did I do it? Well, I started to look at it from a different perspective. And the day I did that, it became the greatest opportunity I could ever, ever dream for. So naturally, the speaking business became my life. So for the last 16 years, I've been traveling the world, speaking all over the world, different seminars, uh, keynote addresses from massive multinational companies, small companies with the same message to inspire people to turn obstacles into opportunities. And in March this year, my business completely, totally collapsed because of the travel restrictions and every single restriction based on COVID-19 that was brought about. Sweden didn't go into lockdown, but everything else, the conference industry is still physically on its knees. There's, there's no live events happening anywhere, physical events around the world. So I had to dust it off a little bit. I, I was so spoiled over the last 10 years that I hardly did any marketing because business came to me. I opened my inbox in the morning, there's two requests from a company. For example, in the Middle East, or there's a company in the US that needs me for an inspirational session. Got book plane tickets, get on my way, travel the world as a blind guy. Loved it. My new reality was I was at home. So I turned to LinkedIn, did some marketing, re reconnected on a different level with all my contacts. And COVID-19 has been such a positive uh, intervention for me on so many levels, on one on a business level. I get to spend more time with my family. Nine o'clock in the morning, I could do a presentation in, for Belgium. One o'clock, I'm doing a presentation for some uh, for a team in Israel. At uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going online for the US. For these three events, I used to travel for eight days to get to those different locations on time. So for, in, in my context, it had a huge positive impact, and I managed to connect with a lot of positive people around the world. Uh, the rabbi contacted me recently and said, hey, Hein, can you jump on a, on a webinar with us? We need you to inspire our team a little bit and our, our youth. So I said, well, with, with absolute pleasure. But on my journey in these 16 years, I once went to address a group of very successful entrepreneurs in Mumbai, India. And what happened was the, the, the host said to me the day after my event, said, Hein, there's a tiny school in Mumbai on the cusp of one of our slums. There's only 40 kids in the school. But what makes the school unique is these kids happen to be deaf and blind. I'm like, what? It's impossible. How on earth, you know, how do you educate kids that cannot see and at the same time cannot hear? You know, my personal biggest asset is my sense of hearing. My entire world, the tapestry of and the landscape and the reality of my world is painted by my sense of hearing. You know, harmonies, music, I cannot think about my world without those things. And you know, I'm also incredibly bad with faces. So imagine I can't hear voices, I wouldn't recognize anyone. So of course I wanted to go to the school. So he said, okay, we'll take you. 
So in the car, he said to me, well, the teachers found out about you. They also want you to talk to the kids. I'm even more nervous. The kids are deaf and blind. You want me to talk to them. So we arrive at the school. I meet one of the most phenomenal individuals in my life. This man has been at the school for 55 years. He arrived as an eight-year-old deaf blind child. He went on to finish his schooling. He achieved, a, he went to study at university. He, he managed to achieve a master's degree in education. Back to the deaf blind school. He's teaching fellow deaf blind children. He's sitting in front of an ordinary looking computer, 20 inch monitor, big one. He can't see it, but you can. Whilst he's typing on a normal keyboard, ASDF touch type keyboard, and uh, there's of course a tiny little braille display below his fingers, you can look over his shoulder, I can put my fingers on the braille display that in real time projects what he's typing, I can, we can swap hands, I can type, he can feel the braille display, and we can communicate. What do you think my first question to him, I haven't had the opportunity to type on this giant of a man's keyboard, sir, how on earth did you achieve a master's degree in education? You are completely deaf and blind. We swap hands. I start reading the braille. He start typing. He says, Hein, you have to understand that deaf blind person worlds begins and ends as far as his or her fingers can reach. And within that, we have to educate. We swap hands. How do you do this? I ask. You want me to speak to the children they cannot hear? He said, whoa, yes, we developed a tactile sign language at the school. The kids physically hold hands and by moving their fingers, they can feel what the other child is saying. I type, we swap hands. That's not gonna solve my problem. They cannot hear me. He said, no, 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 of course the first person can hear. There's 40 of them holding hands. They're sitting in a circle. He relates a story to number two, two to three, three to four, four to five, six to seven, eight to nine, 10. It takes about 13 and a half minutes for the last guy to catch the joke. But you know, he who laughs last in life, laughs the longest, even at the deaf blind school in Mumbai. I was so profoundly moved by that experience. People often ask me, Hein, if you had a choice, I never had one. If you had a choice, Hein, would you want to be deaf or would you want to be blind? I can truly, honestly not answer you, but I can tell you this. The one thing that I know for certain is I do not want to be both deaf and blind. And that this evening brings me to the first universal law I want to leave with you. And this particular law has generated more light into my life than sight can ever begin to. And that is the law of appreciation. Appreciate what you've got. Because I promise you there are hundreds, thousands, in fact, millions of people out there that are less fortunate than you are. And remember, the things that me and you, the things we take for granted, someone else right now is praying for. So of course, as a five-year-old, I had no capacity to even begin to understand the kind of trauma my parents went through sending me to blind school. My little girl, who's now four years old, she doesn't have to go to any school, blind school. She's got to go to school, of course, but not blind school because her eyes are perfectly fine. But I cannot imagine having to send her away. No, I can't. So my blindness had a huge impact on my family. You know, it, 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 on so many levels. My dad was a banker. In fact, he was offered a directorship in Johannesburg. He refused to move from Cape Town. He said, no, I can't do that. I cannot. My, my blind child is in Worcester School. I mean, I would rather stay in Cape Town and find something else to do. So he, he gave up his career as a banker and dad entered the car industry. Every weekend that I got home, there was a different car in our driveway. And like any youngster, I became fascinated, completely fascinated by this car. Soon I knew two pedals has got to be automatic, three has got to be manual. I was nine years old when I realized, Hein, you will never, ever be able to drive one of these. And if you do it, it's going to be extremely illegal to do so. I never, ever allowed that dream to die. And back in 2005, I set myself a goal and said, not only do I want to drive a fast car, I will become the fastest blind man on four wheels. So I turned to Google and I established that the fastest blind man was a Brit, blind guy from London. He drove a uh, car at 223 kilometers an hour. And I thought, well, my personally owned Toyota Taz is not going to do that kind of speed. I have to get some help. 
So I phoned up the local Ferrari Maserati importers in Cape Town, went straight through to the CEO and I put my case in. I said, hey, good morning. My name is Hein. He said, hello, Hein. I said, yes, I'm blind. He said, okay. I said, yes, I'm just curious. Do you have a car that could exceed 250 kilometers an hour? To which he responded, but I've got plenty. I said, okay, will you sponsor me one for the world blind land speed record attempt? He said, of course. I got such a fright when the man said, yes, I just put the phone down. <laughs> so the next day I called him back and I said, I guess we need to sign a contract. He said, what for? I said, for the world blind land speed record. Just yesterday, you promised me you're going to sponsor me a car. He said, listen, young man, yesterday was the 1st of April. I thought you were kidding. Like, no, 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 no. I've never been this serious before. He sponsored the vehicle. It took me six months to convince anybody to get into the car with me. My friend said to me, Hein, we like you, but not that much. So I'm back on Google. I found a company called Speed Record SA. This gentleman promotes South Africa as a land speed record breaking destination. When he put it out there on, on, uh, on Google, I realized that this man, he is my victim. I have to get hold of him. So I phoned him up and he said, whoa, it sounds very really dangerous, but uh, come see me face to face. And we can talk about it. I'm like, oh, dude, face to face. What a total waste of my time. But if it works for you, we can do it. So we grabbed a cup of coffee and he said, we sat down and he said, Hein, how will we do this? I said, I have no idea. But the Guinness Book of Records state, you get in the passenger seat and you explain to me very quickly where to drive towards. He said, okay, we have a bit of a problem though. I said, yeah, what could that be? I can think of a few. He said, no, no, I am not Hein, that great with my left and my right. I'm thinking to myself, my friend, which part of I'm totally blind did you not exactly understand on our phone call? He said, but don't stress. I'm going to stick an L on your left hand and an R on your right hand. I'll be able to see your hands on the steering wheel all the time. I can never mess this up. I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe a man's got a plan. But I also thought to myself, Oof, I'm a bit nervous. But I thought, let me make a bit of small talk. I asked him, what do you do for, you know, what do you do? And this five minutes into the conversation with him, I also realized the man suffers from one incredible stutter. Can you possibly imagine driving at 260 kilometers an hour and this guy goes la, 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 left? Somebody is going to get hurt in the p -p 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 process. I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, brother from another mother. I'm not getting onto a bicycle of this. Oh, I'm out of here. So I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm an engineer. I said, well, if you're an engineer, you must be fairly good with none numbers. That's when we worked out the system of numbers where five was the middle of the runway. If he says six, seven, eight, nine, I'm going too far to the right. Four, three, two, one, I'm going too far to the left. So basically stay on five to stay alive. He's an engineer from Cape Town, South Africa. But you believe me, at 285 kilometers an hour, this guy sounds like a professional auctioneer. Five, 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 four, nine, five, 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 four, nine, five, five, 290 kilometers an hour. He was speaking fluently, lost his stutter completely. So as we drove off the runway, John Webb from Card Blanche was knocking on my window, wanting to talk about the land speed record, Ray at me by my sleeve from the passenger seat, and he's, Hein, there's just something I need to sh share with you. I said, Ray, this is not a good t -t 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 time, my friend. I also developed a little stutter at 280. He said, Hein, please, I just want to t -t -t talk to you. He said, Ray, I said to him, Ray, if it's got anything to do with what happened in your p -p 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 pants, we don't have to talk about it. So he turned to me and he said, Hein, 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. 15 years ago, I lost all the movement in my legs. I lost all the movement in my arms. I could barely tie my shoelaces. I had to give up the one thing I loved most in life, racing cars at faster than 250 kilometers an hour around some of the fastest racing circuits in the world. But I set myself a personal goal. And once I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I said one day, just one day, I'm going to get back into a car and drive faster than 250 kilometers an hour. Not only did he do it, he unselfishly did it in the passenger seat, allowing me to achieve my dream. And that brings me to the second universal law that I want to leave with you today. And this particular thing is so incredibly difficult to build up and you can break it down almost in a split second. It's called trust, trust, nurture your trust relationships. I promise you they will turn out to be the most significant 
relationships in your life, whether a business, personal, it doesn't matter. So a blind Belgian gentleman went and drove a Lamborghini at 308 kilometers an hour, smashing my record by a substantial margin. I was well aware of this. I didn't want to inform my navigator because I know he would say, let's go to the try again. Ultimately, we went back, reclaimed the world blind land speed record for South Africa at an average speed of 322.52 kilometers an hour in the SL65 AMG Black Series Mercedes. And I can happily report to you that my navigator is now completely red of his stutter. So we don't have to go back soon and do it again. So I was speaking at a conference in Cape Town one evening. And as I walked off the stage, the MC chirped me a bit. And he said, hi, you know, you've done these crazy adventures. You've done Iron Man. You've jumped out of airplanes. You've run all over the planet, Antarctica. You've done so many things. How about we cycle the Epsa Cape Epic? Before I knew what I did, I turned to him and said, yeah, we can do the Epic, the mountain migration on a tandem. I'll sit at the back. You can be in the front. And then when we get into some technical difficulties on the single track and we fall off the bike, I'll have an airbag in front of me with your name on it called Harry. He said, okay, I'll be your airbag. So I went to my table, had my dinner, went back home, and I thought we we're all going to wake up the next day, live happily ever after. Nobody will mention this epic nonsense ever again. Nine o'clock the next day, he called me. He said, hi, last night you signed up for the epic. I said, what? He said, yes, you did. I said, well, if I did, the only thing I own is my word. So he said, okay, I tell you what, call them and get us an entry. I said, my friend, call them and get us an entry. It's 75K to enter for the Epic. It's not the local park run. He said, well, just phone them. So I phoned them and I went through to the CEO of the race, the MD actually. And I said, hey, my name is Ian, I'm blind. He said, hello, I said, yeah, I want to ride the 2011 Cape Epic. He said, you want to do what? I said, yes, I'm blind. He said, I heard you. I said, yes, I want to ride the Epic 2011. He said, my friend, let me just tell you something. Sighted people arrive here, they think they can bike. They come here, they break their fingers, their elbows, their collarbones, their backs, their necks, they break it all. I want you to understand something today. It is impossible for a blind person to ride this race. I don't even think you can come and watch. I'm like, oh, okay, close the door in my face. So those of you who don't know what the Epic is about, it is the longest, hardest, multi-stage mountain bike race on the planet, commonly known as the Tour de France of mountain biking. It's over eight days, 800 kilometers, 2,000 meters of climb per day over the most treacherous, most difficult, most technical single track mountains and territories in and around the Western Cape. Also, some of the most beautiful territories in and around the Western Cape. I do not advise this with your eyes open. I certainly do not advise this with your eyes closed. So easy to me, no. The next step is get us a bike. First, we, when we have the bike, they will not refuse us an entry. I phoned Canon down. They said, no, 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 we'll build you a bike. The bike will finish 10 epics. You guys might not make one. I thought, why are they so negative? Maybe I should Google this. So I went to my best friend, Google. I typed in blind mountain biking. Boom, zero results. I thought, Hein, this is a real bad idea. But giving up is not my middle name. So I eventually nagged them so much. They gave me an entry. And uh, the deal was, we're going to ride the epic. We have to do the single track, but we're going to run it, carry the bike, physically run the signal track, single track of the bike. This is how we trained for eight months. We agreed on a ridiculous headline, first blind man to attempt the impossible, the grueling epic. This is how we train 14, 20 hours a week. Every week, the, the story goes out, first blind man to blah, blah, blah. Two weeks before the epic, I got another call from the management team. Hi, there's another blind guy from Brazil. He got a late entry. I thought, mm, nothing like a bit of competition. So this mountain bike outing, I turned into one massive race because I phoned Gary and I said, Harry, I will not be the second blind man to finish the epic. Day one, up Table Mountain, Table Mountain, we are riding the single track. We never trained for this. We trained to run it and jump over the rocks. Now we are riding it. He shouts to me from the front of the bike, Hein, Kus Lunks. What do you do if a guy said, duck to your left, you duck to your left? I went straight into a tree. The guy 10 meters behind me on his bike went oof when I hit the tree. He came cycling up and he tapped my partner on the shoulder. He said, hey, you almost killed the blind guy at the back. I said, yeah, but I told him to duck left. He said, yeah, but there's a big difference between duck left and there's a tree on your left. An hour later, I'm in the riverbed with a man on top of me. Two hours later, I'm bleeding comfortably. This was day one, the shortest stage of the epic. Day two and three was 150 times worse. Day four, when I woke up that morning, I was so purple and blue from falling off that bike, I could see it. I cannot remember what happened on day five and day six, but I do remember day seven, water point two, exceptionally well. 75 kilometers into that day stage, I had a total meltdown. It was physically, painfully, emotionally, traumatically off the scale. And I remember cycling out of that water point, crying like a baby, 
saying to myself, Hein, you can sob until three o'clock tomorrow afternoon, day eight, when we cross the finish line, or you can swallow these stupid tears. We'll still cross the finish line, day eight, tomorrow, around about three o'clock. Why? Simply because giving up on the epic was never, ever, ever, ever part of my frame of reference. We finished it. In fact, the Brazilians were leading us for four hours by day four. Come day eight, we cycled nine out of them. So I became the first blind man to finish the Cape Epic. Now you might go, Hein, why do you do all these crazy adventures? Let me tell you why. It took me, I had to really dig deep because I wanted to know the real answer. Was it just because, is it just because I wanted to show the world I'm blind, I can also do it? No, I had nothing to do with that, nothing. Two reasons. And the one I first want to share with you is by the time I was 16, I have climbed Table Mountain six times. Not because I was a born adventurer. You know why I did it? Because I got so completely tired and heartful of sighted people telling me about Table Mountain, this picture-perfect postcard view. And every day, apparently, it looks different. I got so tired of it. I had to go climb that mountain and get a perspective, my own view on the mountain, what it looks like. And you know what happened in the process? I completely, utterly, totally fell in love with the smell of the fainbos, the texture of the inside of the protea flower between my fingers. And back then I made a deal with myself and said, one day when I have a real job, I will go back into nature as often as I can to recharge, revitalize, re-energize my soul that I can be ready for the challenges that life might bring my way. Now today I know that my picture of Table Mountain is completely, utterly, totally different to yours. But I've also come to learn it truly, honestly, does not matter. The second reason I do these crazy adventures is to benefit an organization very close to my heart. It's called the Hein Wagner Academy in Worcester, South Africa. Currently, 40 plus students, uh, full-time blind students, blind adults. We give adult educational training. The basis is technology this year. For the first time in the world, we rolled out cybersecurity training for the blind. We're training blind people to become cybersecurity analysts. Three-year international course. We provide them with meals, three meals a day, everything, full boarding, full campus accommodation. And our goal is to make them as employable that they can go out and be equal citizens, economically active, and the rest. Why? Simply because of the third universal law, the biggest lesson I've learned in the last 48 years having had the privilege of walking this earth as a blind man. And that is, my friend, the sense of giving, the law of giving. If you give a little bit of what you've got, you will get more than you can ever, ever imagine. Even if it's just a little bit of your most valuable asset, your time. Now, speaking of which, I'm out of mine, but I just want to briefly, for one minute, take you back to my most traumatic memory. When I stepped out of that car as a five-year-old coming back from boarding, I was so excited to hang out with my sighted friends, and I got rejected from that group. Maybe it was in my head. That was what I experienced. They were all on their bicycles. I took my brother's bicycle out the garage. I was determined to go and join them. Two hours later, the tears were running down my face. Three hours later, I, gave, I was about to give up to throw the stupid bicycle down and walk away from it. If I did, my life would probably have turned out differently. But you know what? I didn't. I walked four more paces. In those four steps, I could hear as clear as daylight the reflection of the bicycle's noise coming back from the pavement. Tiny little noise. I could use it to cycle in a straight line. Think about the things I had to deal with staying safe in that bicycle saddle. Oncoming cars, parked cars, pedestrians, lampposts, trees, you name them. We had two huge flower pots on either side of our driveway. I could hear them when cycling past them. Nobody knew this, but the frequency tick, tick, tick went up. I could hear it. I could hear it. I could fly between those pots, stop 10 centimeters in front of the garage door. Look at me. I can do what you can do. And for me to stay safe in that bicycle saddle, I only use four senses because I only own four senses. My challenge to you this evening it's just for a moment, consider the results that you can deliver in your personal life, business life, any level you choose, if you just start using all five yours on a daily basis. We all have challenges. 
Yes, mine some days may be darker than yours. I don't know. And I don't know the answers, but I can tell you this, as I've said before, the day that I started looking at my huge obstacle, this total absence of light, the day that I started looking at blindness from a slightly different perspective, it became the greatest opportunity I could ever, ever dream for. If you change the way you look at things, I promise you the things you look at will change. Yes, I am blind. Exactly what is your excuse? I thank you. That was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that, Han. We really would appreciate it. I'm getting a number of messages on my phone already to say how inspiring you were and how incredible they were and people are speechless. Um, before we jump into the questions, I'd just like Stephen to say a couple of words and then we can hopefully open up uh, the panel to some questions. If you don't mind. So over, over to you, Stephen, thanks. Perfect. Hi guys, can you hear me? Perfect, you're loud and clear. Okay, hi guys. Sure, that's a tough act to follow. Um, thank you very much um, everybody for inviting me. Rabbi Mazinta, a good friend of mine. Thank you very much for the honor of being here. I've definitely got a, a great friendship in Rabbi Mazinta, and I've also got another rabbi, Rabbi Zekri, that's also becoming a good friend of mine. It's, it's an hell of an honor for me to have rabbis as my friends. Tough act to follow, guys. You know, I believe in giving. You know, it makes me feel very humble today sitting here with all five of my senses, and I believe that I must take this as a good example to give more. One of my biggest faults as a character which my board, my fellow partners say is that I'm too generous. And you know what? I'm going to continue with it. I'm very proud to be the chairman of the Bowen Foundation, which Rabbi Mazinta has helped us with uh, over the years. And we give a lot back to the community. You know, Bowen's a very successful development business, of which I'm the founder. We give back a lot. You know, the home is a very precious place, very, very precious. We have a Tremendous design saying in Bowen is what does the, the front door look like when you open the apartment? And you know, that the front door appeal, we call it, is a tremendous gift and a tremendous thing for young people that we create. You know, we try our best to make the apartments as best we can to the best specifications in the best areas and to give people a lifestyle. You know, the, the latest development that we've got, Munyaka, which we had the fantastic opening with Mr. Sorrel Ramaphosa as our guest. And he said, you know, go Munyaka, go Munyaka. And that's what we're doing. We've started construction. We've kindly donated to Rabbi Mazinta an apartment in excess of a million rand, a one bedroom apartment to use in his miracle drive, of which we really, really are honored to be part of this. We have tremendous, tremendous um, good business associates in the Jewish community. And it's our way of giving back. You know, the Jewish community is a small community. They do an enormous amount of good in the world and we believe in it. So we've giving back to the Jewish community and we believe that this can be spread to greater than the Jewish community. So I hope Rabbi Mazinta takes this and cherishes it and we can go forward and carry on giving. Now those are some wise words. I've got all my senses and I'm gonna continue giving to as many people as I can. We want to educate as many people as we can. We also have another association in Johannesburg with people that are really, really charitable. And it's fantastic to be associated with all these people that can give back to some of, by doing well in life, it gives you the opportunity to give back. And I'm very proud of that. And I will continue doing it. Thank you guys. And thank you Rabbi Mazinta for allowing me to join you guys tonight. Thank you, Steve. Um, you know that. Thank you for your time and sharing your incredible story and invaluable work that you really are, you know, contributing to our community and our society. It's, you know, we really do Absolutely. appreciate your comments and sharing it. Um, Anytime. Just to facilitate um, 
with myself and Hilly, we're going to just pose some questions that have come through the audience. Um, Ryan, just before you go you, further, sure. Ryan, before go, Steve, I want to say to you that uh, on behalf of Chabadas and Miracle Drive, thank you very, very much for it. We are overwhelmed. And may God bless you in every way that you should go from strength to strength and give homes to people, which is why God created the world. God wants us to be a home for him. And thank you for, for, for your generosity here, to, here this evening. Back to you, Ryan. Thanks, Rabbi. Sure. Thank Mizzou. you, Rabbi. Thank you, for the, thank you for the kind words, Rabbi. And you can call on us anytime. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Rabbi. That's a, that was really incredible. Um, just to, you know, sum it up, you know, a few lessons that we've learned from, from this evening um, before we jump into a few questions. Personally, you've given me shivers, Han. Um, Steve, you, 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 you've opened my eyes to, to what such corporates can do in this, in this society and this world. You know, sticking with your gut is something that, you know, truly has stuck with me, you know, to learn the law of appreciation, to turn obstacles into opportunities, and on more of a uh, a humorous way, you know, stay on five to stay alive. I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, so, you know, Ryan, sorry, to... can I just interrupt? Sorry, can sure. I just interrupt? I would like to extend to Hein an invitation to contact me because, you know, we have the Bowen Foundation, which is countrywide, and, and my drive is to have the foundation heavily represented in every single place where we work. And we would love to contribute towards that school of yours, Hein. You know, I think it's a fantastic thing that you're doing. And please, if you don't mind, Ryan, if you can put Tyne in contact with me and I'll put you onto our foundation and I'd like to make a contribution towards you guys. Oh, thank you. That's so generous. Thank you so, so much for... Uh, Absolute for pleasure. Really Absolute pleasure. That. Sorry for interrupting, Amazing. Ryan. No worries, Steve. Amazing. Thank you for that. That's, that's incredible. Um, yeah, Han, you know, just to kickstart, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a question from the audience. You know, when doing, obviously, you know, hearing about you and doing some research, you know, um, previously and leading up to this event, I watched the YouTube video that you, you most recently posted or um, that, that was on your, on your subscription page. And, you know, there's, there's a picture of you flying an actual plane. So I don't know if you want to just maybe just touch on that and give us some, some of your insights, you know, tell us about your story about actually flying a plane and not even thought that people have given that opportunity. You know, you know, just yeah. You want to speak about that? Thank you, Ryan. I'll, I'll, I'll briefly share my, my my flying ambitions. They are quite uh, they are quite extraordinary. I would say. Um, um, I uh, I've always been. I always thought that, that you know the, the the solution to my transport problems because most blind people have got some transport issues because we don't drive ourselves. Now I, I live in a country now. Where I spend a lot of time in Sweden, so uh, and South Africa, but in Sweden I have this absolute pleasure and privilege of using public transport i can meet somebody at the exact time in Gothenburg or wherever by using public transport so i always saw that flying is there's so many rules and it, it, it is the ideal platform for a blind person you know to get around so so it's going to happen at, at some point but i i have flown some of the most extraordinary aircrafts and piloted them you know so for example one was the mx2 the one that i use in the red bull air race and i was allowed with the pilot as a friend of mine to do full barrels and loops and everything <laughs> up above of, uh, um, uh, you know the west coast of Cape Town and it was a, such a sense of freedom you know pulling five and a half G's going where I want to go you know obviously he told me when not to go further you know so I had that safety net <laughs> but it was extraordinary so so my my goal is to pilot a, a, a large aircraft from London to probably Amsterdam or one of between two major cities as a massive fundraiser for our foundation in years to come and I'm going to challenge both Airbus and, 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 and Boeing and say, but hey, guys, if you believe your, uh, your planes are that safe, you should actually allow a blind guy in the cockpit. So, yeah, we'll see you'll come on board. But uh, that is uh, one of my, definitely one of my dreams and aspirations. Amazing. Wow, that's, that's really inspirational and that's incredible. Um, and that's something above and beyond um, all of us is, you know, that we can all achieve. So thank you for that, you know, sharing your time. Um, just to jump onto the next question before I ask Kelly to propose one or two, you know, um, you know, everyone's wondered uh, and, and, and you've, you've shared such an incredible life about your amazing achievements to date. You know, I can't help to wonder what's next, what's next on the agenda. Um, you know, what's next for Han Wagner? I know at this moment you, you, you know, you're doing three different talks across the world at one location, which is, you know, incredible in its own life. But, 
you know, what are your aspirations? What, what's next to achieve, oh. if, if any? Yeah. So, so if, if you ask me what, what, is, what, what, is my, what is my single biggest achievement to date, and that, that, is, <clears throat> that is simply accepting my blindness unconditionally. Was the moment I did that, it opened my mind to so many opportunities. Because, you know, for half of my life, I guess, it took me half my life to deal with it and to, to find, because I initially I tried to change it and I was fighting it and I was, you know, and, and we all do that from time to time. We all do that. But, you know, so, so for me, accepting that just opened my world to so many opportunities. So, so my immediate immediate goal is to, is to expand our academy, um, the Iron Wagner Academy. We have plans of the cyber security training to move, uh, to open a campus in Amsterdam. Uh, we also have plans to open a campus in London uh, next year. Um, and then I want to go back at the world blind land speed record, believe it or not. So I, but this time I want to do it in an electric vehicle. So I have, uh, I have developed a pitch for uh, Elon Musk from Tesla. And uh, the pitch is on YouTube. You can go check it out. Elon, if you search for Elon, let's do this. He hasn't seen it yet. Or if he has, he hasn't contacted me yet. But I'm challenging him to be my, my navigator in his uh, Roadster 2.0. I want to do a 420 plus kilometers an hour with him in the passenger seat, make him sweat a little bit. And again, if he believes that the Teslas are so safe, I mean, he should trust me behind the wheel. But yes, it's of course, it's also linked to a fundraiser to raise 420,000 US dollars to the um, whatever speed we reach would be uh, the amount we want to raise for our academy. Uh, worldwide so uh, yeah so i'm on elon's case and uh hopefully as fellow south african uh, he might uh, he might just budge and come on board amazing i think it'd sorry, be you know, so lucky to do so yes Steve. can i ask sure, Hein a question Please. sorry hein can you can you swim yes i can uh, <laughs> absolutely okay, I'm, gonna throw, uh, I'm gonna i'm gonna yes. throw a challenge out to you because i had three fantastic spring box swimming the our lagoon in pretoria and when we open our lagoon at Munyaka, I'm going to get the same spring box to come and swim. And guess what? We're going to challenge you against the spring box swimmers. They're quite quick, but we'll challenge <laughs> you against them for a fundraiser. And whatever money we, we raise from it, because it'll be quite a big event. The last right. event we had at the, the Blyde in Pretoria, there were five and a half thousand people. Sure. My brand ambassador is DJ Euphonic, Timber, a really cool guy. And I'll yeah. challenge you to swim against these guys. And I'll threaten them with absolute murder if they if you if if they beat you, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll make you the we'll make you the winner, and we'll donate all the money for the race to charity oh, wow. to your foundation. But I'm going to take you up on that, Ian. I'm in definitely. Thank you, okay, Steve. Good. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah, have a bit of fun Thanks. with it as well. And I'll wear my speedo. You <laughs> <laughs> know, which will generate will generate more charity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll be, it'll be fun. They gave me a speed up for the for the first one with my name on the bum. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Don't worry, don't Rabbi. Don't worry, Rabbi. It's not that bad. <laughs> you just won't be invited. It's okay. We'll leave him at home. Uh, thanks. <laughs> a bit of fun as well. Thanks. I mean, I just get another message. Yeah, I think Steve as well. If you can share some likes and Han as well. What is the core principle that you keep falling back to during hard times, good times? Um, and, and how do you use that to leverage and propel yourself to go forward and get through the difficult times? I, I'll have a quick go at that. Maybe Steve could also con con contribute. Yep. So, I, so, so for, for me, it is, you know, I never want to go back and, and be that, that miserable teenager, that miserable early 20-year-old when I was fighting this blindness thing. So, so for what, what keeps me going is obviously my, my first and biggest priority is my family. That is, that's my foundation is my, my family. Um, family comes first. It's always on my list of top of my list of goals every year when I set them. But the one thing that I fall back on is I, I never want to be that person I used to be, um, uh, you know, fighting the blindness, being so miserable. I want to be the person I'm now. And today I would not swap, you know, my, my blindness. If I get the chance to see tomorrow, I will simply not take it because it took me a long while to get used to this reality. But I wouldn't want to disrupt this peace and this inner peace I have now for anything, not even sight. Right. Steve, if you'd like to add something. Yeah, I, th I think I think my biggest thing to, to keep me going is people. You know, um, obviously family comes first. I'm very blessed to have a, an amazing wife and an amazing family um, that are very close to me. And I, I have a lot of joy with my family. But, you know, the people, the diversity of this country, you know, you know one minute I'm having dinner 
with the Muslim community. The next evening, you know, I'm having um, Shabbos with the Jewish community. Then I've got Temba coming around. Then I'm blessed that I've, I'm friends with Mr. Ramaphosa. You know, I think it's just the diversity of people, all the five different architects that I deal with and all my staff at work, my fellow directors, jeepers, we've got a, a really diverse bunch. And I think that's the thing that drives me, seeing the success that they can produce. You know, people always tease me and say, you know, my surname's Steve Baldwin, and I always shout them down and say, guys, you know, it's, I'm a very small part of a big team. And I think it's the fun and the joy of meeting youngsters like you guys, meeting the rabbi that phones me 10 times a day to remind me to do this and that. <laughs> You know, guys, that's what makes it. You know, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm blessed with with knowing a tremendous Jewish um, gentleman in the name of Jonathan Bear, who has changed my life, um, despite me not being Jewish. And you know, I just think that's the thing that keeps me going is the people, you know, in, in whatever form, whether it's family, religion, Judaism, Christianity, whatever. You know, I think it's I think it's the people. Um, I've got two rabbis that I can call my friends. I think that's a hell of an honor. I'm um, hopefully going to start a relationship with Hein and you guys. That to me is tremendous. If we can add a little bit of, of money, which is a bit crude sometimes, but that also money helps if a guy like Hein would use it wisely and, and put it into good use. You know, that's what our foundation is all about. And that, that really drives me, that foundation. Amazing, amazing. And Steve, thanks just to rely on that. There's a lot of questions around how do you balance running a massive organization as you do with trying to achieve the philanthropic work you do. I'm saying, how do you dedicate your time? How do you choose which charity you want to donate to? Um, how do you get that perfect balance between the two? You don't, you don't get the, you don't ever get the perfect balance. You know, you have to be driven. You have to spend time on it. I'm very blessed that I've got some fantastic people running our foundation, which is also important. A foundation is also a business, you know, and you need to run it properly and have the right people that guide it and do it correctly. We've set up a very professional foundation. We have a lot of people that contribute towards it. And then I drive it. And I, my team of fellow directors are, you know, they know that if, if I ask and they've got to do it. And we've, a lot of our contractors are asked to do things. We did a, a kitchen at the Baraguanath Children's Home. We've painted fire stations Amazing. and the guys have really, have really jumped in. So it's not always just money related. We've done a lot of good. Every one of our projects must have a community project and must have some art. So, you know, that's also a bit of a, a bit of a contradiction. You know, it's not just community. It's also art, local artists. I support a lot of artists and um, I, I like that side of it as well, which is not always so charitable but i believe you need to connect with it with art it's a it's a good part so yeah i think it's 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 hard to find the balance you know we're driven we're listed so we've got to come up with numbers all the time we get checked every six months you know i've got a fantastic board a hilton saban a jewish um, chairman fantastic guy and we all contribute you know we we helped a lot of people through COVID. a lot of us contractors that suffered smaller guys we didn't give them loans. We just actually gave them the money. Our MD adjudicated it, and off we went. So it's it's tough to find the balance, but you've got to you've got to find time for it. And you've got to give back, and, and I and I have tremendous joy out of it. And and I'll be honest with you, a lot of success and very little failure. You do have failure in charity as well. I mean, it's life, but very little, very very little. Amazing. I think we can all learn from you. Thank you for that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully, one day we'll grow up to be as charitable as you are. 21 hours but you're doing you're doing it already guys you you don't right. realize that you're doing it this evening so you're already yeah, there time. i think just giving your time also a charitable pleasure and thank you for that no it's a pleasure pleasure uh ron do you want to go on right. thanks questions? thanks steve that that was truly inspirational and thanks hilly for the great questions um you know just to sign it off i'm going to propose one last question to to Han before i sign off with the video and 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 let Aaron. Um, at the Chabad, close it off. You know, this talk is about blinded with uh, opportunities and, and one specific thing which really touched touched me today or touched me personally, and I'm sure all of you attendees, is turning obstacles into opportunities. Currently at the moment, you know, in life, we are faced with a pandemic and it's the biggest obstacle to date to anyone from any LSM to high net worth to, to low income earners, um, and that is COVID-19. What advice, you know, Han, for you in a, in a position of yourself 
what advice do you have to the standard household, to the mother out there, to the father of four, to the young driver seeking opportunities? What is your outlook on the future, on the country? You know, if you could leave us with a two cents of motivation to take us into the rest of the week with, with something really giving us something to, to, to stand by. Cool. Yeah, tall, tall order, but, I, but I'll tell you this, that, that, um, that for, you know, outlook for the country, I, I, think, I, I think COVID has, has brought a lot of challenges. I think it's also, it's also brought people, uh, uh, you know, closer together, and not necessarily on a physical level. But I think the one thing that's going to come out of COVID and I think that what the world lacks, and 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 I can I can honestly say I haven't I, I don't know Steve that well, but but I've, I've met him in the last hour and last couple of minutes. But I think that the one thing that 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 hopefully will come out of all of this in the positive on the very positive side is empathy. I think the world lacks empathy. You know, uh, I think we've we in many ways got a lot of very desensitized. But I think COVID is is also especially those people who who know how to give has has, has definitely help us to spread that that joy and help us to spread spread that sense of giving so i i honestly think that you know keep what you're doing and it is tough out there you know just a simple thing i i i love to go run every morning at the gym i go do my 10 kilometer run and i'm ready for the day COVID came i couldn't because for me to find something to run with is, 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 is always a challenge so my schedules etc so i always just go to the local, local gym i couldn't so i couldn't go for my morning run and outside my home, there's a bus stop, and I always go to the right. When I go to the bus stop, there's a bike path, and I never, I've never walked to the left because I never, I never need to. And two weeks into COVID, I decided to go for a walk down to the left-hand side of this bike path, which carried on for another two kilometers. I discovered there's a grass verge on either side of, of this little path. I took my white stick. The next morning, I was out there running my daily 10-kilometer run on my own. Yes, the stick occasionally pokes me in the ribs. But to me, it is absolutely fantastic to be able to go out. I go early in the morning. There's no mums and prams on the road, on the, on the bike path. Very few. The only people out there are the Ironman people, maybe training, etc. So what happened? How did I do this? I, I just started to look at this from a different perspective, like I guess what I did with my blindness. So all I can say is strength out there. It's an unprecedented time. It is unprecedented times we're living. But I do believe COVID is going to bring many positive things into this world. Amazing, amazing. You know, Han, you have such a, thank you for that. You have such a great sense of humor and such a positive energy. It's actually contagious. It's really, it's really admirable. Um, and you've given us all such a sense of appreciation and inspiration. So thank you for that and your wisdom. And thank you, Steve. And thank you for the work that you're doing. It's really, truly something personally as a young driver, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, admired and leaving this conversation with a, a tremendous amount of inspiration. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to sign up with the video and over to you, Aaron. Internationally acclaimed Ball and Properties is transforming the way South Africans live. Offering resort lifestyle living without compromising on sustainability or technology. Providing our residents with five-star living for over two decades. We are supporting South Africa's fight against COVID-19. Visit ballland.co.za. Um, Hein and Steve, thank you so much for your time. Absolute it's pleasure, guys. Pleasure. Um, pleasure. Thank you so much. And on behalf of Chabadas and Young Drivers, we really do appreciate you giving over your time. Um, so thank you. Hilly and the panelists, Hilly and, and Ryan, thank you as well. And please join us tomorrow night for Rambam. It's something not to be missed. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank All you. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.